We thank you, our God, for bringing us here, for every single person you brought in this room and are bringing into this room on this particular Sunday to hear this particular message, to meet with this particular group of people, to fellowship with these people and with you. We thank you for all of the realities of the Christian faith. We thank you that the Christian faith rests upon history and not upon some ideology, that it's firmly rooted in your providence and in your redemption and in the Lord Jesus Christ, birth, life, death, and resurrection. We thank you for all the blessings that now we have because of him. Lord, without him, we know that our lives will be hopeless, lost, dark, dead. But now in him, we have everything we need in order to be your faithful people. We thank you for your day. We thank you for your word. We thank you for your church. We thank you for your Holy Spirit. We thank you for your presence in the worship of your holy name. We thank you for everything you've given us. We thank you for our families, our parents, our children, our grandchildren, our close friends and associates, associates, and those friends of which there are few that do stick to us closer than a brother. Lord, you have been so kind and merciful and abundantly generous to us throughout all our lives, and we have not deserved one earthly thing. But you have given all these things to us because of your sovereign, free, unmerited, unearned, unbought grace in the Lord Jesus Christ. We come interceding for your faithful church all over this world. Today, for those churches that preach the Word of God faithfully, that administer the sacraments of baptism and the Lord's Supper faithfully, and that practice church discipline faithfully, and live godly, holy lives, we pray, Lord, for all those churches, that you would bless them this day, in whatever time zone they're in, that you would bless them, and that you would cause them to prosper, that you would deepen their spirituality, that you would increase their influence, and that you would vastly increase, increase their numbers until the number of those that belong to you and live for you is greater than the stars of the sky and the sand on the sea, uh, uh, on the beach, seashore. And we do pray, Lord, for your church that's under attack throughout this world. We pray in this country as we see increasing attacks that you'd be our shield. And for those various other churches where people are dying for the Christian faith where people are being put in jail and tortured this very day for the Christian faith. Lord, shatter the teeth of your enemies. Cause your people to be secure in you. And whatever comes upon them, may they and we recognize that you cause all things to work together for good to those that love you. We pray for of those for our, among our friends and relatives and brothers and sisters in Christ that are sick. Seriously or not seriously, we pray, Lord, that you would lay your hand of healing upon them. All the various needs and challenges that your people have to face in this world and this evil culture. And because of our own sin, we pray, Lord, that you would meet all their needs according to your riches in glory through Jesus Christ, our Lord. And we thank you for this church. We thank you for raising it up. We thank you for watching over it and blessing it. We thank you for causing it to prosper and to, and to grow. And we pray, Lord, that we would increase in number, that we would increase in influence, that we would increase in, in spirituality and holiness, that we might be a real city set on a hill, a lighthouse where the light would go out, not only in this area here in coming, but also in all the areas from which we come. Lord, save us from mistakes that we've made in the past. Save us from our own sins and help us to be totally and completely dependent upon your word, upon the Holy Spirit. May we not walk in the flesh as we seek to serve you, but may we walk in the spirit. May our lives be uh, known by the way we love each other and the way we serve each other and the way we love you with all our heart, soul, strength, and mind. We come to worship you today in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ that name which is above all names. And we ought come in his name alone and not in ourselves or in the name of any man. And as we read your word now, we pray that your Holy Spirit would speak that written word into our hearts 
and do to us and in us whatever you want that word to do because we know that your word will never return unto you uh, unavoided that it will always accomplish whatever purpose that you have for it in our lives. So enlighten us as we read your word today. We pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Our scripture text today is Hebrews chapter 6 and we're going to read verses uh, 11 through 20. So let us stand for the reading of the word of God. <coughs> Hebrews 6, 11 through 20. And we desire that each one of you show the same diligence so as to realize the full assurance of hope until the end, that you may not be sluggish, but imitators of those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. For when God made the promise to Abraham, since he could swear by no one greater, he swore by himself, saying, I will surely bless you, and I will surely multiply you. And thus, having patiently waited, he obtained the promise. For men swear by one greater than themselves, and with them an oath given as confirmation is an end of every dispute. In the same way, God, desiring even more to show to the heirs of the promise, the unchangeableness of his purpose, interposed with an oath, in order that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we may have strong encouragement, we who have fled for refuge in laying hold of the hope set before us. This hope we have as an anchor of the soul, a hope both sure and steadfast, and one which enters within the veil where Jesus has entered as a forerunner for us, having become a high priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. You may be seated. God thinks it's important for Christians to understand the nature and role and place of hope in the Christian life. That was, is so important to him that he had the author of the book of Hebrews bring it up over and over. You saw it in our text about three times. Well, let's just look at the passages in Hebrews that talk about hope. Turn back to the third chapter of Hebrews, verse 6. We see it for the first time. But Christ was, a faith, was faithful as a son over his house whose house we are if we hold fast our confidence and the boast of our hope firm until the end. And then in our passage in chapter 6, verse 11, it says, And we desire that each one of you show the same diligence so as to realize the full assurance of hope until the end. Then down in verse 18, In order that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we may have strong encouragement, we who have fled for refuge in laying hold of the hope set before us, this hope we have as an anchor of the soul. Chapter 7, verse 18. For on the one hand, there is a setting aside of a former commandment because of its weakness and uselessness, for the law made nothing perfect. And on the other hand, there is a bringing in of a better hope through which we draw near to God. And then the last time the word hope is used in the book of Hebrews is in chapter 10 and verse 23. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering for he who promised is faithful. So over and over, God brings up through the author of the book of Hebrews this idea of hope. Now, why? Well, let me give you several reasons. And the first reason may be a surprise to you. In the first century... Judaism had given up on hope. The rabbinical Judaism of the Pharisees did not have a word or a concept that parallels the word and the idea hope in the New Testament. They'd given up on it. Now you say, well, how could they give up on it when they believed there's a Messiah coming and they didn't believe it was Jesus? 
Well, they did look forward to the Messiah, and they looked forward to a Messianic age, but the coming of the Messiah in the Messianic age was all wrapped up with how perfectly they obeyed the law of God. And so when anything depends upon how well we do, and we have any honesty at all about how poorly we do, that sort of squelches hope in the future. And so Jesus is writing to these Hebrew Christians saying, don't be like your unsaved Hebrew relatives and friends. There is hope. They've given up on it. And that old Jewish negativity toward hope is still found today. Mark Stein, uh, who usually uh, sits in for Rush Limbaugh when uh, Rush is out of town or something, and who's one of the foremost political Christian conservatives in the United States, his name is Mark Stein, Listen to what he said. He might as well have been a Pharisee the first century. Hope is for losers. Hope is passive. Hope is lying on the floor hoping something turns up. Hope is like luck. It might show up. You might be uh, walking down the street and a million dollars may drop in your lap, but it's highly unlikely. Hope cannot achieve the impossible. Hard work and ingenuity can achieve the impossible. You see, the same pharisaical emphases of the first century, hope's not good, but human effort is good. And that kind of hope will always disappoint. It's not that Christians have hope and non-Christians don't have hope. It is that Christians and non-Christians have two entirely different kinds of hope based on two entirely different foundations. And the hope of the Christian will never disappoint him. And the hope of the unbeliever will always disappoint him. Because that hope is built on sand whereas our hope is built on rock. Listen to what is written in the book of Job, chapter 8, verses 13 through 15. Listen. The hope of the godless will perish, whose confidence is fragile and whose trust is a spider's web. He trusts in his house, but it does not stand. He holds fast to it, but it does not endure. He trusts in his house, it repeats itself, but it does not stand. He holds fast to it, but it does not endure. And the reason whatever hope for the future the ungodly has, the unbeliever has, is going to fail him. It's going to disappoint him. It's not going to produce what he wants to produce is because ultimately it's based on man. It's either based on politics, it's based on scientific research, it's based on education, it's based on some human institution, but because it's not based on the Lord Jesus Christ, it is a total failure. So that we can say as Christians, even though every unbeliever has some kind of hope for the future, he's hopeless in reality. Because his hope will always let him down and will always disappoint him. So there is a false hope. There is a true hope. And how do these two things differ? And that brings us to our text. So if you'll turn back to Hebrews 6, 11 through 20, and we're going to see four points here in this passage of Scripture. Uh, write these down. Think about them. Uh, teach them to your children when you go home. Number one, the interplay of hope, faith, and diligence, the interplay of hope, faith, and diligence. Number two, the meaning of hope, the meaning of hope. Number three, the basis of hope, the basis of hope. And number four, the effect of hope. Now, first of all, let's talk about in verses 11 and 12, the interplay or the relationship of faith in Christ, diligence in a Christian life, and hope for the future. Let me read those verses again, 11 and 12. Look at them with me. And we desire that each one of you show the same diligence, 
so as to realize the full assurance of hope until the end, that you may not be sluggish or dull of hearing, but imitators of those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. Now, there's some very practical points made in those two verses about the relationship of faith in Christ and diligence in obeying God and hope for the future. And the first is this. Hope and full assurance flourish in the soil of faith. Hope and full assurance flourish in the soil of faith. In other words, if you don't have faith in Christ, you can't have hope. Uh, any hope you have will, will, will shrivel up. You remember what the first verse of Hebrews 11 says? It says that uh, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. Now, let me translate that just a little differently, but just as accurately. Hope is the foundation of things hoped for. It convinces you of things you can't see, but you see them revealed in the Word of God, and you believe things you can't see because, not because you've reasoned it out, but because they're promises, they're statements, they're truths in the Word of God, and that's what your faith rests upon. So faith is the basis, the foundation of hope. In other words, what faith believes, hope longs for. Hope's not going to long for anything if it doesn't believe anything. And faith is believing in Jesus Christ. It's believing the promises about Christ. It's believing the teachings of the Word of God. And, and when we believe that and we grow in that faith and we're constantly nourishing that faith with the Word of God, what happens? I, hope starts increasing. I can tell you if you neglect and quit reading the Bible and quit coming to church regularly and quit sitting under the preaching of the Word of God, and just read and take the Word of God seriously in, in Bible study, haphazardly, your hope is going to diminish. And once your hope for the future, you'll start quit thinking about the future. You'll start worrying more about the future. Because faith is the one thing that nourishes, and the Word of God nourishes faith. And what happens when faith fails and hope goes downhill? What happens to you? You live for the present. You want to satisfy only immediate desires and needs. You have no hope for the future, so it really doesn't matter. You give up on it. So you become even more sluggish and even more dull of hearing and even more unfaithful. What's the use of being faithful? I don't know what the future holds. Until eventually, what's their first part of the book of Hebrews talk about? Hebrews 6. Until you just slide to the point. Well, you say, forget this. Forget this marriage. When I uh, <clears throat> counsel married couples that are having problems, most of the time, and maybe you've heard me ask this question to you, that I don't think there's anybody in here married couples having problems, <laughs> uh, that uh, the first question <laughs> I usually ask is, or, or a Christian that's having personal problems, when did you quit reading the Bible? And they'll say, how did you know? <laughs> well, it wasn't because of any insight I had. It's because if you don't read the Bible, faith withers. And when faith withers, hope dies. And when you lose hope, nothing has any future. A marriage does not have any future when you give up on hope. Just like a nation doesn't have any future when it gives up on hope. Just like an individual doesn't have any future when he gives up on hope. So the important thing of these first two verses, 11 and 12, is that faith is the soil where hope grows. Now, what happens when you're believing the Bible and you're increasing your faith and your hope to see these things realized in your life and to experience full salvation in the end? When all these things are functioning properly in your life, what happens? You have full assurance of salvation. You become more and more convinced that you're a Christian and you rejoice more and you rejoice in your relationship with God more and you know that nothing can separate you from the love of God. All of these things work together. That hope and the full assurance of salvation both flourish in the soil of faith in Christ. Here's another principle in those first two verses. Diligence nourishes hope. And hope inspires diligence. Diligence nourishes hope, and hope inspires diligence. 
That is, the more diligent you are at putting into practice the things that you believe, the things that you learn in the Word of God, the more you're going to see the Holy Spirit bring about real changes in your life, the more you're going to see answered prayer, and the stronger your hope and your confidence of God and your assurance of salvation is going to be. And then the more hopeful you become, the more inspired you are to be a better Christian and to strengthen your faith and to be more diligent because not because you're trying to make points with God, but because you know that someday you're going to see him and you want to see a smile on his face and you want to please him. So diligence nourishes hope and hope inspires diligence. Now there's a third point in these first two verses. And that is that faith and hope and assurance and diligence and patience prevent sluggishness and are the traits of those who inherit the promises of God. Nobody else is going to inherit the eternal promises of God and the full blessings of salvation in heaven with God throughout all eternity except the person who believes in Jesus who's diligent in serving Him, who knows what hope is, who endures the trials of life, that's the person that won't be sluggish, he won't be dull of hearing, he won't be backsliding, and those are the traits of the person that someday shall inherit in full at death all of the promises of God. So by the grace of God, be diligent till you die. By the grace of God, believe in Jesus till the day you die. By the grace of God, be hopeful and full, uh, fully assured of salvation to the day you die. Because that day, as soon as the doctors pronounce you dead or if before, as soon as your eyelids close in death, that split second, you will inherit in full all of the promises that God ever made to his people, especially of eternal life in his immediate presence so that when you die if you are a believer you're diligent in working out that faith in your everyday life and serving him which means hope is growing in your life and you're persevering and well-doing no matter what the culture does that when you die the same thing's going to happen to you that's described in the life of Bartimaeus you remember Bartimaeus he was a blind man that Jesus met blind all his life can you imagine living your whole life and never seeing anything? Never seeing the beauty of creation, never seeing the ones you love the most. And Jesus comes up to him, and Jesus heals him. And Bartimaeus opens his eyes, and the first thing he sees is not his wife or children, not the clouds and the flowers. But as soon as he opens his eyes, the first thing he sees is the face of the man that healed him. When your eyes close in death and they're opened in eternity, you will see the same face that Bartimaeus saw. Because it's a life of faith and diligence and hope and assurance and perseverance that inherits the promises of God you remember what Jesus said in the parable all those that go through the, uh, the straight gate shall have eternal life that's a misquote I didn't that's, did, I didn't quote it right it says all those who go through the straight gate and walk down the narrow way enter into life the straight gate you might say is faith and repentance believing in Christ and turning from your old life. And the narrow way is the life of diligence and hope and endurance that grows out of faith. It's going through the gate and walking down the narrow way that has as its outcome eternal life. Now notice some words in these first two verses. It says, um, uh, verse 12, that you may not be sluggish, but imitators of those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. 
inherit. That's an important word. In the Bible, an heir possessed. To inherit something was take possession of it. And the New Testament says that if you're an heir, then you're, if you're a child, then an heir. So an heir is a child of God. That's what it's talking about. That the children of God who belong to God by faith in Christ are heirs of all the promises of God. And how could we summarize all those promises? I mean, the Bible's full of them from Genesis to Revelation. So how can we summarize all those promises? If somebody who's a child of God through, is a child of God through faith, he is an heir and a possessor of all the promises of God that God made to him in the Scriptures. So what would be a good way of summarizing all those promises? Romans 8. Being children of God, we are heirs of God and joint heirs of Christ. Heirs of God, that means as believers we're going to inherit God Everything God is, you want to spend the rest of your life discussing what God is? That's how long it takes and beyond. Everything God is and everything God has. What does God have? Everything and beyond. And that summarizes the promises that God has made to all those children of His who are children by faith, as many as received Him, to them he gave the right to be called the children of God, even to those that believe in his name. So when you become a child of God by faith, you are in that moment a possessor and an heir of God. Who cares about a big bank account when you got God? That you're an heir of everything God is and everything God has. And then, beginning with verse 13, he gives us an example of one of these men who through faith in the promises of God and long-suffering and endurance inherited these promises. And it's Abraham in the Old Testament. So let's read verses, uh, the next verse, uh, 13. For when God made the promise to Abraham, since he could swear by no one greater, he swore by himself saying, I will surely bless you, and I will surely multiply you. And thus, having patiently waited, he obtained the promise. Now, before we go any farther and look at Abraham's example, let's talk about what does hope mean. Because when the Bible uses the word hope, and this world uses the word hope, it means two different things. In the world today, it's sort of a negative thing. It's sort of crossing your fingers and hoping for the best. Well, I hope it doesn't rain today, but it probably will. I got my hopes on the Braves as a world champion. So you see, uh, hope is a negative idea, just wishful thinking. But the word hope in the Bible, in the Old Testament, let's start there. The word hope in the Old Testament means to ik, the expectation of good things from God. If I'm hopeful, that means I expect God to do great things for me, not because I'm so wonderful, but because He's promised me those things in His Son. And that expectation has in it trust. I'm going to trust God to do what He promised, no matter how weak I am. Uh, that hope has in it a yearning, I not only expect God to do great things for me, but I yearn and long for these things to take place in my life. It also, in the Old Testament, includes patient waiting. It may, just like Abraham, these blessings may not come at first. I may have to go through struggles and hardships, but I'm going to wait, and I'm going to patiently wait and joyfully wait, and I'm going to seek refuge in His mercy until He sees fit in His timetable to cause all these promises to come true in my life. So hope is a rich word in the Old Testament. Let me give you an example of what it means in Jeremiah 29. It says, for I know, the Lord says, For I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not for calamity, to give you a future and a hope. 
Then you will call on me and come and pray to me and I will listen. You see, all these ideas, a hopeful person expected God to bless him. Not because he was good, but he trusted God to act in grace. He yearned for those promises. He was willing to patiently wait for them no matter what he saw all around him. Now that idea of hope in the Old Testament shapes the idea of hope in the New Testament as you would expect. And so in the New Testament, just like in the Old, hope is not based on man in any way, shape, or form. It is based entirely upon the living and true God. Psalm 71 says to the Lord, You are my hope, O Lord. You are my confidence from my youth. By you I have been sustained from my birth. So whether you're talking about the Old Testament, New Testament, the difference between a hope that disappoints and a hope that does not disappoint is the Christian, a Christian has his hope in the living and true God and is dependent upon him to act in grace. An unbeliever hopes in sand. Now, there are, so therefore, the word hope in both the Old and New Testament means, write this on the inside of your eyelids, it means confident assurance that God will be faithful. Confident assurance that God would be faithful. It's not something I'm just crossing my fingers and hoping for in the future. But I am confident, I am certain, I am sh sure that the one true and living God will always be faithful to His Son, faithful to His Word, faithful to His covenant people, faithful to me as His child. So that's what hope is. Somebody has hope for the future, believes what the Bible says about Jesus is true, and then is confident and certain that God will be faithful to do for and in and with Him everything God promised in the pages of Scripture. So that hope in the New Testament has three elements. Write these down. Three elements of hope in the New Testament. Number one, expectation for the future, just like the Old Testament. The Christian expects things to happen in the future according to the Word of God. Things that will be good for him, Romans 8, 28. And we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those that love Him. So he expects God to do great things for him. Not because he's good, but because God is generous. You remember Hebrews 11.1, 1, Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. Second element in hope in the New Testament is certain trust. Certain definite trust. I expect things to happen because I trust God. And I know God is not going to let down His people or let us go. He's going to be faithful to every word that He's promised. Romans 8, 24 through 25. For in hope we have been saved, but hope that is seen is not hope. For why does one also hope for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, but believe, with perseverance we wait eagerly for it. Doesn't matter you know, I see some of the promises in the God, uh, of, uh, of uh, God in the Bible concerning this world. Concerning the conversions of nations in this world. I, I look at the promises of God and I see promises that say that someday the believers in this world will be more numerous than the stars of the sky and the sand of the seashore. And I've had people say to me, uh, I, I just don't see it, Joe. I just don't see these things happening. I said, I don't see them happening either. If I based what I believed on what I see, I would be the most desperate, discouraged, pessimistic, pessimistic guy I know. Somebody said once, well, how can you be so optimistic about the future in the light of what you're reading in the newspaper? And I said, well, I don't get my doctrine out of the newspaper. And you see, that's, that's very, I mean, it sounds so silly. But that is the point. We walk by faith in the Word of God, not by the things that we see. We don't allow the things that we see to shape our view of the future. We trust God in His Word to do what He said He would do, even if everything looks like to the contrary. And then the third element of faith in the New Testament is patient endurance. God doesn't give you everything right off the bat. Sometimes you've got to go through times of struggle, times of testing, 
And so that hope in the New Testament always has this element of patient endurance and perseverance. Listen to Romans 5, where Paul says, We rejoice in our tribulations. We rejoice in our tribulations. You know what tribulation means? About everything you don't like in this world. <laughs> Heart attacks, bankruptcies, car wrecks, slander. Paul says, I just love my tribulations. Why? Well, he doesn't enjoy the pain in them, but he loves what God does through them. Listen. And so he's patient. We rejoice in our tribulations, knowing the tribulation brings about perseverance. Perseverance brings about proven character. Proven character increases our hope. And hope does not disappoint us. Because the love of God has been poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit who was given to us. So you see, all these things work together. We have hard times, painful times. What does that do to us as real Christians? It wants us to keep on being patiently enduring and persevering. What happens when we're persevering and believing in Jesus and trusting Him and obeying Him? It improves our character. God uses it to improve our character. And what happens when we see our character improved? Our hope is strengthened. God really is at work in me. He who has begun a good work in me will keep on performing it until the day of Christ Jesus. And so you see, that's what uh, hope is. Hope is expectation for the future, certain trust in the Lord, patient endurance. You could define it as confident assurance that God is faithful. Now I ask you, is that your faith? Is that your hope? Do you have the full assurance of hope? Are you abounding in hope? Or you just have a glimmer of hope. So many problems in your life. So many challenges you face in the future. You don't know how you're going to face them. And that your hope is just a little teeny glimmer. Or is your hope just bright and shiny. and Fully assured. There's a verse in Romans 15. That says, now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. And then the next verse connects abounding in hope, being extremely hopeful, abounding in hope with filled with goodness and with being filled with the word of God. You see, that's the same emphasis we got here in Hebrews 6. You want your hope to abound so that people can, can see your hope? I've had people that uh, talk to various people in our church, and I say, well, why do you uh, come to our church? And he says, said, because your people seem so hopeful. Hope just seems to ooze out of them. And this world is looking for hope, a hope that won't disappoint. And so how do you ooze hope in your life? so that it can be seen by the people. Be filled with goodness. Be diligent in living out the Christian life. And be filled with the knowledge of God by constant study, worshipful study of the Word of God and sitting under the preacher, preaching of that Word. Now, in verses 13 through 16, we have the basis of hope. What does the Christian hope rest on? Let's look at it. 13. For when God made the promise to Abraham, since he could swear by no one greater, he swore by himself, saying, I will surely bless you, and I will surely multiply you. And thus, having patiently waited, he obtained the promise. For men swear by one greater than themselves, and with them an oath given as confirmation is an end of every dispute. In the same way, God, desiring even more to show to the heirs of the promise the unchangeableness of his purpose, interposed with an oath in order that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we may have strong encouragement, we who have fled for refuge, in laying hold of the hope set before us. Now, he, he uses the example of Abraham to show that the basis of any hope that won't disappoint you 
is the divine promises of the word of God, the word of God itself. And he uses Abraham. Turn, and he's talking about Genesis 22. So turn there with me to Genesis 22, uh, 16. And let's look about this uh, very, very shocking time in Abraham's life. Abraham was called to serve God about 20 years before this. He was called out of the earth of the Chaldees, and as soon as God called him out of there to go to the land of Palestine, God says, I'm going to make you a, a multitude of nations, and through your seed, every family of the world will be blessed. That was 20 years earlier. And now, God gave him the seed of Isaac, who would be the great, great, great granddaddy of Jesus. Now, Isaac is a young man. And uh, now God comes to Abraham. And he says, Abraham, you've believed all the promises that I've given you. You've lived a diligent life. And so now, in obedience to me, I want you to take your son Isaac up on top of this mountain. And I want you to slit his throat and offer him on, a, on an altar as a sacrifice to me. Can you imagine if you were Abraham? I mean, you're 120 years old. This is your last hope. Isaac. What would you do? Well, let me tell you something about Isaac before we go on. I've seen uh, pictures of Abraham sacrificing Isaac, and Isaac's this little baby, or this little uh, toddler, and he's lying on the altar. Isaac was 20 years old, or thereabout. Isaac could have kept his old daddy from doing anything <laughs> harmful to him. Isaac went up the mountain with him voluntarily laid his life down on the altar. All right, let's look at verse 16, Genesis 22. Uh, well, let's start with verse 1. Now, it came about after these things that God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said, here I am. And he said, take now your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I will tell you. So Abraham, by the way, Moriah is on the mountain range where Calvary is. So Abraham rose early in the morning and saddled his donkey and took two of his young men with him and Isaac, his son. And he split wood for the burnt offering and arose and went to the place of which God had told him. On the third day, Abraham raised his eyes and saw the place from a distance. And Abraham said to his young men, stay here with the donkey and I and the lad will go yonder and I will worship and I will return to you. Anybody have that translation? Doesn't say it. Abraham says to his young men, y'all stay here at the foot of the mountain. And then when I do everything I'm going to do up there, we, Isaac and I will come back. And Isaac and I will return to you. Now what did Abraham think? I think Abraham thought he was going to have to kill his son and God was going to raise him from the dead. But let's go on. And Isaac spoke to Abraham, his father, and said, My father, and he said, Here I am, my son. And he said, Behold the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Abraham said, God will provide for himself the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. So the two of them walked on together. Then they came to the place of which God had told him, and Abraham built the altar there and arranged the wood and bound his son Isaac, who could have gotten free in time he wanted, and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. And Abraham stretched out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. Now in Hebrew, when you say somebody's name twice, it's a sign of love and affection. Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? Abraham, Absalom, Absalom. Abraham, Abraham. And he said, here I am. And he said, don't stretch out your hand against the lad and, and do nothing to him. For now I know that you fear God, since you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. By the way, it says your only begotten son from me. Then Abraham raised his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him a ram caught in the thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram 
and offered him up for a burnt offering in the place of his son. And Abraham called the name of that place, the Lord will provide, as it is said to this day, in the mount of the Lord it will be provided. Then the angel of the Lord, which was the visible revelation of Christ before his incarnation, then the angel of the Lord called to Abraham a second time from heaven and said, By myself I have sworn, declares the Lord, because you've done this thing and have not withheld your son, your only son. Indeed, I will greatly bless you. I will greatly multiply your seed as the stars of the heavens and as the sand which is on the seashore. And your seed shall possess the gate of their enemies. And in your seed, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. And so there you see the great promise and oath that God made to Abraham upon which Abraham based his hope for the future. Even though it contradicted everything he saw. I want you to turn with me to Romans 4 because there is a great description of Abraham in the moment that he's doing all this in Romans 4. And let's begin reading with verse 16. For this reason it is by faith that it might be in accordance with grace. In order that the promise may be certain to all the descendants. Not only to those who are of the law but also to those who are of the faith of Abraham. Who is the father of us all. As it is written, a father of many nations I have made you. In the sight of him whom he believed, even God, who gives life to the dead and calls into being that which does not exist. In hope against hope, Abraham believed. He could see no reason at all why to hope for the future as he had that dagger over Isaac's throat. But he still hoped on. In hope against hope, he believed in order that he might become a father of many nations according to that which had been spoken so shall your descendants be and without becoming weak in faith he contemplated his own body now as good as dead since he was about a hundred years old in the deadness of Sarah's womb he wasn't afraid to face facts he looked at himself Looked at his wife. Ain't no way we're going to have a baby. But in spite of what he saw. In spite of the fact that everything he saw seemed to contradict the promise. He went on hoping. And he went on believing. Verse 19 again. And without becoming weak in faith he contemplated his own body now as good as dead. Since he was about 100 years old. This was before he sacrificed Isaac. Uh, with respect to the promise. Uh, and the deadness of Sarah's womb. Yet with respect to the promise of God. He did not waver in unbelief. But grew strong in faith. Giving glory to God and being fully assured. That what God had promised he was able also to perform. So even back in the beginning, 20 years before the potential slaughter of Isaac, Abraham believed the promise of God. You and your wife, 100 years old, you're going to have a baby. No matter what he saw, he went on believing. He was fully assured that God would be faithful. And now 20 years later, he's being called upon to believe that promise again. And he's about to sacrifice his son in obedience to God. But because his hope rests uh, securely on the infallibility of what God had promised, God blessed him and his hope never, ever wavered. You remember what the Confession of Faith says, Westminster Confession of Faith? It says, faith believes to be true whatever is revealed in the word for the authority of God himself speaking therein. Yielding obedience to the commands trembling at the threatenings, embracing the promises of God for this life and for the life to come. Now there is a point that I want to make before we go on. And that is our hope and our faith is to have the same character as Abraham's. 
we are to believe in the promises of God to us in Scripture. Properly interpreted. Now, don't do like a lot of people do. They'll read a verse, and that verse will strike them a certain way, and so they'll go around telling me that this is my promise from God. And they misinterpret the verse, and they have no reason to believe because it's not even addressed to them. It's addressed to a totally different situation. So don't read the Bible and think, well, if a verse hits me to write, that's God telling, making me a promise. Mm -mm. Believing the promise of God means interpreting the Bible that you believe in the way the Bible says it's supposed to be interpreted. So you make sure you've properly interpreted the promises of God. You embrace them. You lay hold of them. And then you expect God to be faithful and to cause all of them to come true in your life. What promises? Answer. The same promises God made to Abraham in Genesis 22. You read Galatians 3, and you'll see that Galatians 3 does not interpret these promises in some type of ethnic sense as if they belong to the literal physical descendants of Abraham who has his DNA. But it says that Abraham is the father of those who believe, and those who believe the way Abraham believed are the sons of Abraham. And, the blessed, and they're the seed of Abraham. And Christ is the seed par excellence. And we're the seed of Abraham in him. And through that seed with a capital S and seed with a small s, every family of the earth is going to be blessed with salvation. And our number is going to be greater than the sand of the seashore and the stars in the sky. And we're going to possess the gates of our enemies. So that all those who belong to Christ by faith, regardless of ethnic origin, are heirs of the promise of God and seed of Abraham. So what promises are you and I to believe? Promises God made to Abraham. And as those promises were re, uh, reiterated throughout the scriptures, but understand that we are to interpret them in a covenantal and a messianic way. And God no sooner had given Abraham this great promise, and he says, I'm going to do a fix to it an oath. And God says, since I can't, there's nobody above me, and nobody of greater authority than I am, God says, I'm going to swear in my own name. Now, can you imagine if God were to come up to you and say, Bob, Jim, David, I swear to myself as God that I'll be faithful to you throughout all eternity. You're going to doubt him? Are you ever going to question again whether you're safe and sound in the arms of God? Of course not. That the oath of God, and that's what God did to Abraham. God said, Abraham, I swear to you in myself, because there's nobody greater than I to swear in, in the name of. I swear to you in the name of myself that everything I promised you will come true. And I will not let one of these promises fall to the ground unfulfilled. Now, who was Abraham? Who did we read Abraham was? The father of those who believe. So when God swore that oath to Abraham, he swore to you and to me as he swore to our great, 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 great spiritual granddaddy. Now, why did God make that oath? Did he make that oath because uh, his word wasn't sufficient? Did he make that oath because the word of God wasn't clear enough and wasn't certain enough? Did he say, Abraham, I swear to you that I'm going to fulfill my word because my word is just sort of weak. And it leads, needs a little push. And it needs a little confirmation. And it needs a little proof. Of course not. I mean, what if God were to come up to you without an oath? And God were to say to you, as he's done in the Bible, I will be faithful to you throughout all eternity. You ever going to doubt that? 
You're not going to ask for an oath. You're not going to ask for a second witness. If God says something like that, then you're going to believe it. No matter how hard it is to believe, you're going to believe God's going to be faithful to me. So why did God add an oath to it? Because he knows human frailty. Because he knows how impressed we would be with an oath and how much we would need an oath. We ought to be satisfied with his word. But he gives us double assurance to every one of us as Christians. I promise you that if you believe in me in a true faith that shows itself in diligence and hope and perseverance, I will maintain that faith and that hope. I will support you and hold you up. And I will love you throughout all eternity. And you will inherit me. All that I am and all that I own. And because you're such a weak, pathetic creature, I'm also going to give you an oath. And I swear that even when you let me down, I'm never going to let you down. So you and I are the only people in this world that has any kind of real hope. Our world is starving for it. We're the only person that can give it to them. I want to, I want to conclude. I have more to say, but I've got to quit. I want to conclude with this great quote by R.J. Rushdoony. A hope concerning the future becomes the cause of that future. A hope concerning the future becomes the cause of that future. That is, if you believe a promise in the Word of God, and you're going to live a di diligent life in faithfulness to it, hoping and praying and confident that that promise will come true, you're causing the future to happen according to the promise of God. You see how important hope is. And no matter what, we Christians have no excuse to ever give up on hope no matter what happens. Hope keeps us faithful and joyful to the end. And your responsibility and mine is not simply to rejoice in the hope that we have. But if we're going to be like Christ at all, we must do what we can to help unbelievers see that they have no hope at all apart from the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Christ in you is the hope of glory. If there's anybody in here today that came here hopeless or your hope was based upon man or yourself or your own actions and endeavors, that hope will disappoint you. And I urge you to cast that fake kind of hope aside and you lay your life at the feet of the Lord Jesus Christ who is the only person that can give hope forever, that never disappoints. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you for the faith that he has given us. We thank you for the diligence he's given us. We thank you for the hope and the ability to endure that he's given us. God strengthen these things that accompany salvation in us so that the world can see them and see there really is hope in Jesus. And no matter what happens to us in this life, Lord, keep us believing your word. Keep us in your word. Keep us meditating upon your word because we know that's where hope flourishes. For Christ's sake, amen.